Hello, hello. Um, I think I have to apologize, first of all, because uh, when I put this talk together, I thought it would be a good idea to throw in some animated GIFs and uh, to make it a bit more lighthearted. And before I knew it, it turned into a bit of a GIF fest. So if you do feel motion sickness kick in, um, the bathroom's out to the left. Uh, so my name is Kai, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I'm originally from Germany. I've been living in Melbourne in Australia for the last 12 or 13 years or so. And for about 10 years, I've been designing websites and UX, UI for, uh, as a freelancer for clients in the US and Germany and in Australia. In 2012, I sort of uh, realized that all the stuff that I was producing was quite ephemeral and it was you know, put out on the internet and it was disappearing within a few months or a few years um, into the ether that is the internet. And so um, in 2012, I decided to um, try my hands at something different and uh, something that lasts. And that, different, that something different is Offscreen Magazine. Offscreen is a magazine about people that use technology and the web to be creative, to solve problems, and to build successful businesses. And it's a print-only publication. It's uh, published around three times a year. Sometimes I manage to fit four issues in. And um, I've pr published 10 issues so far, so there's... Um, I'm working on number 11 now, and across all those issues, I've uh, produced on, and sold around 35,000 copies or so. There's no team behind Offscreen. It's a one-man operation, so I do everything myself from um, designing, editing, publishing, distributing, promoting, uh, mostly from my home in Melbourne and sometimes from a little shared office. Um, and it's actually published in Australia, but it's printed in Germany, and it's uh, shipped from a location in a warehouse in Germany as well, and I'll mention why soon. If you work online, you know that we like to share a lot of process. We you know, write a blog post about how we made our website responsive or how we minimized the latency of our database infrastructure. And when I entered the print and publishing world coming from the tech and web, web community, I was surprised to see or to find that no one was really sharing anything that was happening behind the scene. And that's because magazines are born in a different era, right? They, if you go to a, a newsstand to an average uh, magazine shop, most of the magazines on the shelf there are published by pretty large publishing houses that um, are you know, running on massive overheads and are still relying largely on the old uh, business model of advertising. And so it's a pretty competitive and secretive industry that where no one really wants to share how things work in the background. And it's still sort of trying to come to terms with the new rules of the internet economy. And so long story short, um, when I started, I didn't really, couldn't really find anyone to talk openly about you know, how do you actually make a magazine. And so when I launched Offscreen, I decided to change this. I really wanted to document my transition from being a web designer to being an indie print publisher through my blog and through social media. And I started to write a lot about behind the scenes stuff, so how I you know, make things. I started to write about uh, the failures and the successes that I had and more generally my thoughts on indie publishing. And so for tonight, I picked a few uh, topics from my blog that I thought would be worth mentioning here to you guys to give you a bit of insight into what it actually means to create a magazine, a print magazine in the digital age. Logically, the first thing I want to talk about is transparency. Um, a pop, um, contributor in one of the previous issues once said to me that people don't really buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And I found this, found this quite helpful and quite um, true for off-screen as well. Uh, as I said, I've started to write a ton of stuff about um, you know, what happens behind the scene, like how much money I made with a magazine to having an emotional meltdown because of a, a faulty cover print. And I found that every time I wrote, every time I published something about the making of the magazine, whether it was good or bad, people started to get more personally sort of attached to the brand and to the magazine. And the result is that I now have this really super friendly and almost intimate relationship with most of my readers. And I found that um, being very um, honest and very direct uh, with my audience creates this environment of mutual authenticity and and just honesty that I think um, are responsible for now having produced 10 issues of the magazine. I couldn't have done it without it. And so I think magazines have always been a great tool to build community, um, but nowadays with all the digital tools and social media and blogs and email, newsletter, all that stuff, I think it becomes even 
uh, easier and, 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 and better for us to connect uh, and create a dialogue, an open dialogue with our readers. And so I think Offscreen's viability is built on that um, really intense relationship with its community. But it doesn't stop with the reader. When I, once I actually started writing about making the magazine, I had a lot of other publishers get in touch with me and tell me, you know, really appreciate what you're writing about, and I feel exactly the same way. I had the same problems, the same issues, the same challenges. And so the result of that was that I created a little Facebook group where we now have about 60 independent publishers, um, all print publishers, talking about the challenges, um, about you know, what, what it actually means to create a, a digital a print publication in the digital world. And it's cool seeing so many people come together and learn from each other. And to be honest, it's quite nice. I, I feel quite proud um, of creating that little bit of legacy um, that goes beyond just producing my own product. And it all starts, the lesson here is that it all starts with sharing your, your process, just sitting down, writing what you just learned today or what, what happened in the process. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the phrase of the thousand true fans. Um, and it goes that you, all you really need in order to make a living with your work is a thousand true fans. And uh, I'm not sure whether that applies uh, to all industries and to all areas or to all projects, but I found it to be quite true for off-screen as well. So with every issue I put out, I have this core group of people that's really vocal and really passionate about a, a, the launch of a new issue. And I don't know them personally. I you know, recognize their Twitter avatars or their, their email addresses. But nevertheless, I try to make a bit of an extra effort to acknowledge their ongoing support. And so this guy here, his name is Oliver, on the, on the right there to your right. Um, he ordered a whole box of, of issue number two when issue number two came out um, to sell, to resell to his friends and his, his colleagues in London. And, uh, you know, not, not only that, he actually went back two weeks later and interviewed them about their experience with off-screen, which I find really fascinating. And he put everything on a Tumblr, and it became this big thing. And it's interesting that this guy, without any incentives, really, um, became a salesperson for my magazine. And so I think um, Oliver is a, a great measuring stick for me of how well or how badly I'm doing as a publisher, but also as a community builder. And I think the, the purpose of being indie is basically to create a thousand Olivers. All right, this thing died. Um, as I mentioned before, there's no team behind off screen, so naturally I have to spread my, myself quite thinly. Um, when I started with the, with the magazine, I had this massive stack, of mag, uh, massive stack of magazines of other independent magazines sitting on my desk. And as I was going through them, I felt really inspired and I felt really motivated to create something similar. But at the same time, I felt really terrified of how could I, you know, as someone that has no prior experience whatsoever in print or in, in publishing, how could I create something that's equally respectable or, or awesome? And it turns out I, didn't, I couldn't really and I didn't really have to. Um, the thing is that as a one-man band, you can, you can in fact play a lot of instruments at the same time, but you'll never be as cool and as awesome as this dude. I would say I'm more like that guy. <laughs> so in practical terms, this means that you know, my writing can sometimes be a little bit better. There could be less typos in there. My photo retouching could be a bit more precise and it could be a bit more beautiful. The marketing could be a bit better. I could invest more time and maybe money into selling more copies. But the thing is that I combine all of these different roles into just one person. And so what I offer my readers isn't um, perfectionism, it's personality. <clears throat> they get a magazine with a face attached and a person they can talk to. And so I guess what I'm trying to say here is that don't be intimidated by your heroes uh, or by the big thing that's sitting on your desk that's really great. Um, you can achieve a lot with a little as long as you don't get sidetracked and distracted by the achievements of others. The great thing about indie publishing is that you can pretty much take 99% of the rules of traditional publishing and chuck them out the window. I really believe that um, as long as you have some interesting content and a, and a great community, you can just slap a cover on both sides and call it a magazine. And that's pretty much exactly what I did. When I started with Offscreen, I didn't really have a master plan or a business plan. I didn't have a plan at all. All I knew was that I wanted to make something other than a website. In fact, I didn't even know InDesign. I had to um, jump on a website called lynda.com, which is like a tutorial, video tutorial website, and uh, pay 25 bucks and spend two or three weeks just studying um, InDesign and typography and prepress and color management and all those things. And what the scary part wasn't so much learning all these new tools. The scary part, I think, was to admit to myself and to my friends and my colleagues and my family that I was now a beginner again. I was starting from scratch. <clears throat> 
And um, there's a quote that I want to show you guys from an article that's about perfectionism, and it says, success means having to forgive oneself the horrors of the first draft. And I found this to be very true with off-screen as well. Because when I look at the first issue of off-screen now, I'm everything but proud of it. And I'm really happy it's sold out because I hate the idea of giving it to people and hang, handing it over. But it's great to, if I take a step back and I look at the 10 issues in front of me on a table, it's great to see uh, my own progression and how much um, I matured over the mistakes that I've made. So I think starting with a simple, I don't know, is a really great motivator to uh, prove to yourself what you're capable of. Of course, <clears throat> a lot of us are scared when we enter a new, a new field, and uh, no one likes to fail, no one likes to be uh, made a fool in front of others. But what many forget is that when you leave your own familiar circle and you enter a new one, you also bring your own unique set of skills with you, right? And so at the same time, you also, um, you know, don't, as long as you don't know the, the status quo or the rules of the, end, the field you're entering, you also uh, have a unique sort of view at things and you have a unique sort of problem-solving approach. And I think uh, being a bit of a rebel allows you to um, look at things in a different way and maybe turn some heads along the way. To give you a simple example, um, in the web community, we often come across situations where we see room for improvement, and then we go about a tool, or go about developing a tool that helps us get there. And I, th I would say that I brought my problem-solving skills that I learned in the web and tech community with me in the publishing community. Uh, this is what it looks like, for example. This is a, um, uh, an order management system that runs in the background of off-screen, of the off-screen website. Uh, when I looked into e-commerce tools and software that uh, would help me um, bridge the gap between a person ordering online and um, my shipper, my logistics company, sending the magazine to my, my readers, I couldn't really find anything. And so I got, a, got in touch with a friend of mine, a developer in Melbourne, and uh, he helped me build this custom order management system that now runs in the background off screen. And uh, it allows me to get my weekly, my weekly orders out within, a, a couple of uh, click, within the clicks of a couple of buttons. And um, so basically, I, I export this file, send it to my printer, and he uh, uses that file to print shipping labels, attaches them to the, to the envelopes, puts my magazine inside, and then sends them off to my readers. And I think without my background in tech and you know, my problem-solving skills or whatever you want to call it, I wouldn't have come up with the, with the idea of um, creating this little tool to bridge that gap. And so don't, don't underestimate being an outsider. I think a lot of times um, you come up with pretty amazing solutions um, coming into a new field. Um, coming from digital um, and going into print, the finality of print was something that took a lot of getting, getting used to for me. As a web designer that worked for clients, I usually had a project that would be maybe three or four weeks at a time, and then at the end of that project, you come up, uh, you, you produce a, maybe a zip file of maybe five or six um, um, you know, major templates. It's basically a bunch of code and a, and a few files, a few images weighing in at maybe 500 kilobytes or so. In print, um, you work for months on end towards this freakishly giant beast of a file that you then export in InDesign, which takes 10 minutes, and then upload to your printer server, which takes, if you live in Australia, takes about six hours. Um, and then you just realize that you missed five typos and you have to do the whole thing again. But what I'm saying is that in print and digital, you have this constant iteration process. You, you, you almost want things to break. You throw it online and then you wait for things to break so you can constantly improve upon that. But with print, of course, that's not possible. You have to get to that final file. And as a result, nothing you produce will ever be perfect. And it took me a long time to come to terms with that, that fact, that all my issues will have their flaws. And not just because I screw up, but also because of the, just the nature of print. For example, um, you know, the temperature and the humidity in the printing facility can change the way that the ink um, um, is absorbed by the paper, and that changes the way it looks. Or there was a case where my uh, book binder uh, ever so slightly changed the composition of the chemicals that um, you know, binds the pages, and uh, as a result, some of the pages fell out. Or there was uh, a case where my, my uh, paper supplier changed the location of the paper mill from, I think, Denmark to France, and so they were using different materials, different recycled materials to, to create that stock and uh, different water and everything, and the result was that the paper felt different and it wasn't really what I was looking for, so I had to change it. And all these things, all these problems, all these challenges are what makes the medium of print so awesome, but it also what makes it so damn frustrating at the same time. Okay, um, let's be honest here. I'm not really reinventing the wheel. I'm not creating anything groundbreakingly new with off-screen. It's a magazine, right? 
And the content that's in the magazine, to some extent, you can probably find on blogs, on, on podcasts, and videos, and you know, audio books. Um, but as I found as soon as you take that content and you put it on a piece of paper and you sh start shipping it around the world, for a lot of people it becomes more real in a way. And there's a little story that I always tell when I give a talk, and I want you to pr I won't deprive you of it. Um, <clears throat> There's a guy who was in one of my issues, and um, when the issue was out, he actually bought a, a box of magazines to give to his, uh, to his friends and his family. And when he gave a copy of that magazine to his mom, it instantly made her cry. And so this is a guy who is pretty successful. You know, he's got a company. I think he now has about 250 or so employees. Um, he's got the obvious signs of success, like a big house, a big car. But for his mom, the success of her son became real when she saw the name of her son printed on the cover of a magazine. And I think that's the emotional power that emanates from real products that we just don't get with digital. I think our relationship with digital products will never be as intimate as with something that has been made by hand or manufactured and then shipped around the world directly to people's homes, uh, doorsteps. Um, most magazines out there are still running on the old uh, business model of advertising. So the most important metric for them is the, uh, the circulation number. Based on that number, they will charge businesses X amount of money to print uh, an ad in their paper. What differentiates indie publishers is that we don't really work for those big businesses. We work for our readers, and that means that we have a much higher cover price and equally high production values. But at the same time, a lot of us can't really make it sustainable with just a high cover price, so we still have to work with businesses. When I set up Offscreen, I really want, didn't want to um, scatter uh, advertising like pages of advertising throughout the magazine and disrupt that e uh, reading experience because you spend so much time making it look nice. Why would I just then uh, throw some really ugly ad in the middle, right? And so I came up with a uh, sponsorship model where I contacted eight companies and told them, look, I'm going to do this very subtly. You get a black page, you can put your logo in the middle, and we get a small description text at the bottom, and that's it. And we place all those eight sponsors in the center of the magazine, and that, that's pretty much all you get. And surprisingly, they said yes, and now um, those sponsorships cover pretty much all the production costs that I have. And what's interesting is that people started, once the first issue was out, people started to get back to me and say, um, I really like the way you incorporated those ads. Um, and for the first time ever, I actually read every single word in the magazine, including those in the ads. And I find it really interesting that you can make something a lot more subtle and a lot less in your face, and people pay more attention, not despite, but because of it. Uh, I'm almost out of time, but I only got three more slides. Um, when I tell people that off-screen um, costs $22 and uh, comes out as a print-only magazine, no ebook, a lot of times I get a bit of a frown and a bit of a you know raised eyebrows. But then once people start flicking through it, once they see the physicality of the magazine, they usually get it. And I think uh, the, the the magazine as a content delivery model um, really is more about expensive, crafty, sort of really high quality magazines and not so much about the throwaway, the cheap throwaway copies that you, you see at most newsstands. Um, a publishing friend of mine really uh, nicely summed this up in a, in a quick quote, and he said, in the same way that the automobile allowed the horse to become a creature of leisure rather than of labor, so too has digital publishing moved traditional publishing into the realm of luxury. And I think it's very, tr it's, it's very true, he's very right. I think today's indie magazines are a little bit like that expensive chocolate brand that you treat yourself to every now and then. You know by buying it that you know, it's a bit expensive, it's, you feel a bit guilty about it, but that also makes you savor every second and every bite. And so here I am. I'm a web designer who makes a print magazine, and of course everyone's, the question in everyone's mind is, you know, print, isn't it dead? Um, I think many of us are starting to realize that the um, um, Spending, us spending so much time on, on a screen and reading everything on, on, on a device oftentimes feels strangely unsubstantial and temporary in a way. And I, th I think there's a lot of studies out there that actually suggest that um, content consumed on paper is actually consumed more thoroughly and is remembered much longer than, the, than their digital counterparts. And so I think somewhere in there is where the future of print lies. Maybe it's time to start thinking about paper versus screen, not as old versus new, but as two different and complementary devices, each stimulating a particular mode of thinking for a particular time of our day. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>